Hi, this is Ravi Gudetti and Manos Brilakis, presenting case 120 for the Manual of Percutaneous Coronary Interventions. This is a case of staged percutaneous coronary intervention of a culprit and non-culprit lesion in a patient with an acute coronary syndrome. The patient was a young man that presented with non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. He had uh, diabetes mellitus as well as below knee amputation. He did have a recent respiratory infection, but he was COVID negative. His troponin peaked at 3.3 and his creatinine was 2.6, reflecting acute on chronic kidney disease. Echocardiogram showed an ejection fraction of 35% with multiple wall motion abnormalities, both inferior and inferior lateral. These are the images with echo contrast to facilitate visualization. And then a stress test was performed that showed ischemia in both the anterior as well as the inferior wall with an ejection fraction of 22%. Coronary angiography showed no significant disease in the circumflex. However, the LAD was occluded with significant calcification. This appeared to be a chronic total occlusion with distal filling via ipsilateral epicardial collaterals. The right coronary artery had also significant calcification and did have a lesion in the mid-segment along with an intraluminal filling defect that likely represented thrombus. This is another view demonstrating the filling defect in the right coronary artery. The patient was discussed by the heart team and a decision was made to not proceed with surgery because of the previous history of below knee amputation along with the low ejection fraction as well as the renal failure. As a result, the patient was referred for PCI, which had multiple considerations, including the need for right heart catheterization and possible hemodynamic support. The plan was to do first the culprit lesion, which considered to be the right coronary artery, and then do the LAD if uh, the RCA intervention was uneventful at a later time. Right heart catheterization showed a wedge pressure of 33 millimeters mercury with an RA pressure of 12 and a PA pressure of 56 over 22 with a preserved cardiac index of 2.51. Given the high wedge pressure, the patient would fall into the category of abnormal but stable hemodynamics. Also, the PCI that was planned for him was high risk given the LADCTO and the intraluminal filling defect in the right coronary artery. So this is a case in which hemodynamic support can be considered. For cases like this, the preferred device is the impella, unless there is a contraindication like left ventricular thrombus, mechanical aortic valve, severe aortic regurgitation, and VST or AST. This is discussed in detail in video 14.1. In our patient, there were no contraindications and femoral access appeared to be accurate on the previous angiogram. Therefore, Impella was chosen for hemodynamic support. We obtained right femoral artery access and um, inserted the Impella sheath. And then we noticed that there was poor undergrade flow after the Impella sheath was inserted, which is something that can happen even though the artery appears to be okay. Uh, sometimes there can be occlusion of flow due to the large size of the Impella sheath. We had an extensive discussion with the vascular surgery team. We pulled the sheath further back and there appeared to be slight undergrade flow. And a final decision was made to actually perform the PCI and then determine at the end whether any additional treatment would be needed for the right common femoral artery. So we engaged the right coronary artery with a JR4 guide. There's still the intraluminal filling defect, although it has been a few days since the diagnostic angiogram. We performed intravascular ultrasound that um, demonstrated uh, the presence of calcification. Um, there was um, severe calcification distally. There was also a filling defect, also again severe calcification here. And uh, the reference vessel diameter more proximally was um, 1, 2, 3, 4 millimeters, so large proximal diameter. So looking at this again, there is significant calcification a little higher up from the area of the filling defect that appears to be soft, likely representing thrombus. We determined that um, there was a risk of distal embolization given the size of the thrombus, and that is why 
we decided to use a filter and pollock protection device, specifically the spider device. The spider device is used by first using a workhorse wire to wire through the lesion, as was done in our case, and then the spider device is delivered over this guide wire, but in our case, it was not possible to advance it through the mid-right coronary artery. As a result, we changed our strategy. We upsized our guide to a 7 friends AL1 guide that fit well and provided strong support, and we were then able to deliver the spider filter distal to the lesion. The rest of the procedure was uneventful. We considered doing prophylactic atherectomy, but we decided to first start with a balloon angioplasty because of the presence of intraluminal thrombus, and actually there was good balloon expansion, and uh, that resulted in a successful result after standing of the lesion with drug eluting stents and no distal embolization with a small amount of thrombus retrieved in the filter. 50 ml of contrast were used for this case, and the patient did not have any worsening of the renal function. And at the end, we actually closed the perclosed sutures we had used at the beginning, and that resulted in good hemostasis and also preserved undergrade flow. Therefore, there was no need for any additional intervention on the right common femoral artery. The patient did well after the procedure, and then was subsequently referred for stage PCI of the LAD chronic total occlusion. This is the dual injection, demonstrating a well-defined tapered proximal cap in about a 30 to 40 millimeter lesion length. Distal vessel is patent and is filling via both epicardial as well as septal collaterals from the right coronary artery. The plan, therefore, was to first perform an undergrade wiring attempt followed by ADR if we became subintimal, followed by retrograde if that failed. We did have femoral and radial axis with an 8 friends guide on the left, on the left main, as well as a 6 friends guide on the right coronary artery. Undergrade wire escalation with polymer jacketed wires, a filter XTA and Mongo, resulted in subintimal guide wire crossing. And that is why we used the Stingray balloon together with um, the double-blind stick-and-swap technique with an Astato and a Pilot 200 in an attempt to re-enter into the distal lumen, but we were unable to do so, possibly because of uh, severe calcification of the LAD. As a result, uh, we switched to retrograde crossing through a septal collateral from the right coronary artery, and then after doing that, we were able to perform the reverse car technique. We have a guide extension into the LAD, to facilitate retrograde crossing, and then uh, we were able to inflate a balloon and then advance the retrograde guide wire into the undergrade guide extension. The patient uh, did well retrograde. We did not have to use hemodynamic support. We eventually were able to externalize an R350 guide wire, predilated the LAD, and then uh, performed stenting. There was still diffuse disease distally, and that is why intracoronary vasodilators were administered an additional layer of stand was placed with a nice final result and Timothy flow to the LAD. The patient had a good recovery, and this case does illustrate several points that can be helped perform complex PCI. The first one is the importance of a good plan for tackling multivessel coronary artery disease, especially in the setting of left ventricular dysfunction as well as acute coronary syndromes. The heart team approach is important to determine the optimal revascularization strategy. In this particular case, the patient was not a good surgical candidate and PCI was recommended. Given the poor baseline hemodynamics, hemodynamic support was used with an impeller device when performing the right coronary artery intervention. There was no flow undergrade to the leg after the impeller sheath was inserted. However, in the end, there was no significant issue with the leg after closing the perclosed sutures and removing the impeller device. Another way to prevent this problem is to remove the peel away impeller sheath and actually insert the repositioning sheath that has a lower profile. We also used a filter for the right coronary artery that had a large intraluminal filling defect that appeared to be thrombus. And then finally, we did a staged PCI of the LAD in which um, there were several techniques used, undergrade, undergrade dissection, re-entry, and retrograde, with a nice final result. 
actually the extra plaque or subintimal crossing ended up being beneficial because it facilitated expansion of the stents placed in the heavily calcified LED. Thank you.